I break with tradition uh, because typically on a Christmas Sunday, you hear almost the same, what is it, maybe four passages, three passages about the birth of Jesus. Well, we did that a little bit earlier. We did that back on the first Sunday in December. And actually this morning, we're looking at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, which is about Jesus squaring off against Satan and Jesus succeeding where Adam failed. And one of the reasons I do that, one of the reasons why I, I take a departure from the traditional texts that are, that are typically taught in churches on Sunday morning is because I remember uh, my father-in-law who used to go, who, who before becoming a Christian would go to church uh, on those rare occasions, on those special occasions, on Easter, uh, on Christmas Sunday, right? And I, I think he made a comment once and he said, why, why should I go? They just talk about the same thing every single time I go. And that is in all likelihood, maybe they did. They, they talked about the birth of Jesus, which is wonderful to talk about. But every single time he went, it was like hearing the same story. Um, and it got into his head that, oh, this is, you just, that's all you do. You just go there and you hear this one message about this, about the birth of Jesus every single time. So I thought it was an opportunity for us to just kind of explore around, but still be focused on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as we celebrate the birth of Christ during this season, I think it's, it's fitting to remind us of why Jesus had to come. We talk about Jesus as the Son of God. We talk about Jesus as Lord, and we talk about Jesus as Savior. Jesus came to save us. He came to redeem us, and he came to rescue us. And obviously, one of the questions that we need to ask is why did we need to be rescued? If Jesus comes to save us, that means we needed saving. If Jesus is the Savior, that means we needed salvation. And so I want us to look at the big picture of all of Scripture, why Jesus came to save us. And looking at the big picture, we can divide all of human history really into four big parts, four stages. It begins with creation. God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. He created man and woman in his image to worship and to delight in him, their creator. But shortly after creation, scripture tells us of the fall. Instead of obeying God's commands, Adam and Eve listened to the serpent Satan in the garden. They ate of the forbidden fruit. They directly contradicted and disobeyed God's express and explicit commands. And that disobedience had widespread repercussions. The consequences reach all the way to us because the penalty for sin is death. And as a result, every generation of human beings after Adam and Eve have experienced death. But in love, God sends his one and only son, Jesus Christ, in order to redeem sinners, in order to repair the relationship with God. Jesus came to pay the penalty for sin for all who place their trust in him. And one day, it looks forward to the consummation or the restoration. Before ascending into heaven, Jesus commanded all believers to go and tell the world about him to continue propagating the message of the good news that Jesus came to save sinners, that Jesus offers salvation, that there is hope, that there is forgiveness, that there is an offer of reconciliation through Jesus Christ. And one day in the future, we will witness the consummation of God's plan of salvation. God will establish a new heavens and new earth where all the redeemed will worship him forever in fullness of joy without any hindrance of sin. So here at Laguna, we've been studying the life of Jesus from the gospel of Matthew. And we started it on the Sunday after 
Thanksgiving. And our goal was to arrive at the passage we have before us today. And the reason I planned for us to examine this passage for Christmas Sunday is because we see, we see Satan and Jesus going toe-to-toe, going head-to-head. Satan faced and successfully tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. And now, Satan will face off against Jesus in the wilderness. So please take your Bibles out and join me in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, which is our passage of study for today. Please join me in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. You can pull it out, pull it up on your phone or challenge your children to turn there faster than you. And when you get there, I would invite you to please stand for the public reading of Scripture. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. I'm reading from the ESV. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to, them, and he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. May God bless the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. As a reminder to all of us, last week, we looked at the ministry of John the Baptist. This is Matthew 3, verses 1 to 17. We looked at the ministry of John the Baptist, and John and Jesus meet at the Jordan River. And then John baptizes Jesus. And at the baptism of Jesus Christ, God the Father spoke audibly from heaven with the declaration, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And with that declaration of Jesus' identity, God has just announced to everyone, this one, the one who's coming out of the water, this one is God's beloved son. This one is the promised Messiah. It's as if God had placed a huge spotlight on Jesus. It's as if God had this gigantic arrow and points this one, in bright lights. God had announced to the world that this person, the one who was coming out of the water, is Jesus, is God's promised Savior. And more importantly, Satan has been put on notice. Satan willingly and knowingly opposes God in every way that he can. Satan wants to ruin God's plans. And the first time we see Satan in Scripture, he is tempting Eve, after all, to eat of the forbidden fruit. He is tempting Eve, and by extension, Adam. Come, disobey God. Because Satan wants to screw up God's plan. He wants to thwart God's ways. Then God himself pronounces a curse upon Satan in the garden. And and God pronounced this curse, telling Satan that one day, a seed, a person of a woman would come to crush Satan. Now, if you were Satan, 
If you were in Satan's shoes, what might you have thought? You have just heard God Almighty declare to you that one day someone will come and crush you. One day someone will come and crush your head. If you were Satan, you'd be curious as to who this person might be. You'd want to know, well, okay, so like in the future, how far into the future? Next week, next year, next millennium? You'd want to know who this person is. Like an adult, a kid, a baby? Who would this person be? In fact, if you were Satan, you'd probably spend a good deal of time trying to sabotage and frustrate God's plans. So it stands to reason that Satan, throughout all of human history, has been on the lookout for this promised Messiah, this one who would come to crush Satan. Satan has been wanting to know who is this one who is promised of old, who is this one who will come and put an end to me? Now, at the baptism, God the Father made it clear, it's this guy. He's the one. This one is my beloved son. This one is the answer to your question, Satan. Who is it? Who is it? It's him. It is Jesus. And now that God himself has removed the shroud of mystery concerning the identity of this Messiah, Satan will try to make Jesus stumble. Make no mistake, in the temptation of Jesus Christ, the stakes could not be higher. If Satan successfully causes Jesus to sin, Jesus would be disqualified from being our Savior. Redemption would have been undone. Only the death of a sinless Savior, of a sinless sacrifice, could pay the penalty for sin. Now, Satan tempted the first man, Adam, in the garden. But now, Satan will tempt the true and better Adam in the desert. So Satan will tempt Jesus, but the outcome here will be different which is why the title is called Jesus Succeeds Where Adam Failed. As we work through this passage, we need to recognize that the details of of the actual temptation that Jesus faced would be different from us. And yet the theme is eerily familiar. First, in verses 1 to 4, is the temptation to doubt God's care. The temptation to doubt God's care. Verse 1 says that Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And the wilderness is not, you know, it's not the forests and it's not the forests of Oregon. The wilderness is a barren environment. The wilderness is the desert. The wilderness is characterized by barrenness, dry and devoid of any real plants. Not much lived or survived in the wilderness. For 40 days out there, Satan was tempting Jesus. And scientific research shows us that 40 days without food approximates the limits of the human body. It didn't say he didn't have water, it just said he didn't eat food. But near the end of those 40 days, Satan specifically tempts Jesus by enticing him to turn a stone into bread. Now, by this point, Jesus is starving. He is near his physical limits as a human being. And knowing this, Satan suggests that Jesus provide food for himself. Now, thinking a little bit, would it have been, is it wrong as an action for someone to turn stone into bread? No. There are no prohibitions that I know of in scripture against turning stone into bread. The act itself is not explicitly sinful. But notice that Satan has custom made this temptation for Jesus. I highly doubt any of us would be tempted to turn stone into bread. 
You'd be like, you're ridiculous. You're delusional. Like you can't do that no matter how hard you try. I don't care what kind of hocus pocus magician stuff you can do. You're not going to do that. You can't really do that. But Jesus can. Jesus could. We can't turn stone into bread, but Jesus could have. So Satan has really custom made this temptation for Jesus. And the question we have to consider is why is this listed among the temptations of Christ? If turning stone into bread by itself, the act itself is not a sin, why is this listed among the temptations of Christ? And the answer is because hidden beneath the surface of Satan's suggestion is the temptation to doubt God's care. Jesus is the son of God. Right? We just, one chapter before, this is, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is the son of God and God truly does love and care for his son deeply. God just publicly declared that, after all, it, Jesus was his beloved son. Therefore, the question is whether Jesus will trust that his father will take care of his own needs in accordance. The question is whether Jesus will trust that God will take care of his own needs. Will Jesus trust in what is proclaimed and declared in Scripture? Psalm 37 25 to 26, a psalmist, the psalmist says, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Matthew 6, this is Jesus speaking. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You see, the test here is whether or not Jesus the Messiah will trust in God's care. And in response to Satan's temptation, Jesus responds by quoting from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, where Moses is reminding Israel of her history. The whole, the whole verse says, and he, God, referring to God, God humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And this passage refers to a time when the, elder, when the Israelites were also wandering in the wilderness, it's basically all of the book of Numbers, and they didn't have any food. And so they asked the Lord of heaven and earth for food. And in response to the needs and the cries of his people, God lovingly provided manna from heaven. Manna literally translates as, what is it? In English, we would say it's a whatchamacallit. It's a what's it. And God provided that from them straight out of heaven. God sent food down to provide for his own people. Yet, this passage reminds us that God allowed them to be hungry. He allowed them to feel the hunger, to feel the pains. And then he also provided for them. And the point was to teach them that God will take care of them. God was trying to teach the Israelites to trust that God will lovingly take care of their needs. Now, to be clear, none of us are going to be tempted in the exact same way that Satan tempts Jesus here. None of us would ever be enticed by such a temptation because we can't turn stone into bread no matter how hard we try, no matter how hungry we are. But the temptation beneath Satan's suggestion is not confined to bread, because at its core, in its essence, this is the temptation to doubt God's care. And this is something that we all face. This is something that we have all asked. 
when things don't go your way, when your life seems to be filled with no, when your path is marked by adversity, do you doubt God's care? Do you question, where are you, God? Do you see this? Do you know what I'm going through? Are you faithful to trust in his faithfulness? Or are you quick to doubt? God provides what we need, when we need, and in the way that we need. Our needs can be met in unexpected ways. And oftentimes, God may provide for our needs through other people. But something that Christmas reminds us of is the depth of God's care. That it is always there. He sent his one and only son to save us from hell. It is the unfathomable love of a father who would even send his own son to die. Because the baby who was born in the manger would die on the cross. God sacrificed his own son on the cross for you. You know, when I had my first child, the most common question I got besides, are you okay? Apparently, I must have looked pretty bad. <laughs> um, but besides, are you okay? Is the question of what have you learned as a new father? What has God been teaching you as a father? And of course, I would joke. I mean, it's true, but I would say like how much we need sleep. I don't know. How, how, how much a bad night of rest messes me up. Yes, I mean, those are true. But probably the overwhelming, most significant thing that I learned becoming a parent is a deeper appreciation of the love of God. Because though the baby would, you know, wake up multiple times at night and didn't want to eat or feed quickly or efficiently, I love that child deeply. Though the child couldn't talk and mostly just cried, I love that child so much. I still do, all of them, all five of them, all five of them. I have loved, so it's like past, okay, past perfect. It's, it was true then, it's true now, okay? Um, but in addition to learning how much I did not know about babies, I think that being a father helps me appreciate our Heavenly Father more. Because I love my children. But I could not think to sacrifice any of them for other people. And yet, this is the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That he would send his one and only son. That people who disobey and rebel against him might be forgiven, might be reconciled, might be restored. And that's the love that God has for us. That's the gift of Christmas. So when you are tempted to doubt God's care, you need only remember the cross of Jesus Christ. That God loved his own with a cross. And that that love was unfathomably deep deeper, really, than we are capable of loving. And that's the first temptation. Though we would never turn stone into bread, we, we still understand the root of it. Because we, too, are tempted to doubt God's care. 
we are tempted to wonder if God knows, if God cares. We question, God, what are you doing up there? We need only to look at the cross to remember that God truly does care and that he cares for us far deep, deeper than we can understand. The second temptation is to test God's protection. Look with me at verses 5 to 7. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not. Put the Lord your God to the test. Now, this second temptation from Satan is is a little, a little bit stranger than the others. And Satan is being more devious this time because this, this time he uses scripture. You want to argue the Bible? Satan knows scripture very well. And he's using scripture here to suggest that Jesus throw himself off the temple mount, the temple roof. Satan quotes here from Psalm 91, 11 to 12, as proof that God will protect his chosen one. Notice, every time Satan tempts him, he says, if, if you are the son of God, as if to sort of subtly jab at Jesus. Prove it to me. Really? You're really, you're really the son of God? If, right? And while it is 100% absolutely correct that God would have sent his angels to rescue Jesus, the Messiah, had Jesus thrown himself off the roof, Satan is enticing Jesus to presume upon God to act, to test God's protection. So Satan sets up this trap for Jesus. And really, you think about it, if Jesus had jumped, there's only two possibilities, right? Right? But it's sort of like a lose-lose situation. You know, when somebody flips a coin, it says, heads I win, tails you lose. If Jesus jumps and dies, then the Messiah would no longer be able to die on the cross. So we're still stuck. We're still unredeemed. The penalty for sin has not been paid. And we're still in a bad way. We're still condemned. God's plan for redemption would have been thwarted. On the other hand, if Jesus jumps and was miraculously rescued by angels, as is testified by Scripture, as what Scripture promises and says, then Jesus would have stepped outside the bounds of God's predetermined plan for him. Jesus would have sinned against God and disqualified himself from being the sacrifice for sin. Either way, Satan would win. Instead of jumping, Jesus responds by quoting from Deuteronomy 6, which says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, Jesus has confidence in God's word. He has confidence that God will protect him. He does not see a need or a benefit to making God prove it. What seems like Satan's suggestion for Jesus to show faith is actually a way that someone could force God to do something. This is forcing God's hand. If you genuinely believe that God would protect you, you would not consider it necessary to test that protection. Now, obviously, none of us are going to be throwing ourselves off the temple roof. Psalm 91 does not apply to us. God's angels uh, are not promised that they will lift us up so that we will not stub our toes. But the question still remains on whether we would trust in God completely or whether sometimes we are tempted to test him, to force his hand. Are you someone to presume upon what God says he will do. Like you, you want God, oh yeah, you say you'll do this. Show me. Show me. Let me give you some examples of what this might look like. Number one, 
I can sin and engage in all sorts of immoral behavior because I know that God will forgive me. God's forgiveness is without limit, right? I'm free to sin whenever I want to because his forgiveness will always be there. The problem with this type of thinking is that it emphasizes the forgiveness of God without, while ignoring God's repeated calls to walk in holiness before him. God's grace is not to be viewed or used as a free pass to engage in whatever sin. God's grace is to be appreciated, to be viewed as a comfort when we stumble, which we will. But it's not a license to engage in sins that displease the Lord. Because the goal of the Christian life is to be pleasing to God, is to honor him, not to test the limits of his grace and to see, well, God says he's going to forget everything. So let's see how much he can really forget. That argument, by the way, is posed in the book of Romans. Another example is when someone thinks, I can engage in whatever temptation because I know God will deliver me. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says what? That no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. That God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Again, this is another, this is another manifestation of trying to test God's protection. The temptation, remember that even this passage, that temptation overtakes you. It's not you're out looking for it. You don't go out looking for the temptation or trying to engage in it. In fact, even the preceding verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Both of these are examples of what it means to presume upon God. It is a subtle form of making God prove it to you. There is a difference between trusting in what God says and forcing God to show you that he will do it. You can be confident in what God says without forcing God to prove it to you. This is the temptation to test God's protection, to probe the limits of what he will do. Third, in verses 8 to 11, we find the temptation to reject God's plan. The temptation to reject God's plan. Verses 8 to 11. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now in the third temptation that we have listed in Matthew 4, Satan shows Jesus all of the kingdoms of of the world in probably what is some sort of vision. And Satan offers to give Jesus authority over all those kingdoms. Now, people have questioned whether this is a legitimate offer. Okay? And I would say it's like half legitimate. It's kind of a half truth. A lot of things that Satan says are half truths. Satan certainly has some degree of influence over the world. 1 John 5, 19 says that we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Yet even Satan is restrained by God. If you recall the beginning of the book of Job, Satan has to ask permission from God in order to afflict Job. But regardless of how legitimate this offer is, Jesus does and did have the right to rule over all the kingdoms of the world. Psalm 2, verses 7 to 9 says, I will tell of the decree, the Lord, has, the Lord said to me, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So God does promise that one day he will give the kingdoms of the world to Jesus the Messiah. Satan's offer does not change the end result. 
Jesus will eventually rule this world, sitting on a real throne in a physical kingdom. The temptation is not about ruling the world. It's about the process and timing of it. It's not about ruling the world because that will happen. It's about the process and timing of Jesus' rule of the world. So at this point, if we're, if we're kind of thinking through it, Jesus has got two offers on the table. He has the offer from Satan, a chance to rule the world, and an offer from God, also a chance to rule the world. But the difference in the two offers comes in how those offers are played out. It's in the details of the offers. Satan's plan involves Jesus betraying God. It involves Jesus bowing down to worship Satan instead of God. It is a change of allegiance. It is realign yourself. Choose Satan instead of God. But other than that, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Change your allegiance, change your side, and you can have the world. In contrast, God's plan involves Jesus being betrayed by one of his closest 12 friends on earth, Judas Iscariot. God's plan was filled with rejection and hardship. Jesus was opposed by the religious leaders of his day. They frequently debated him and challenged him. Oh yeah, show us. We want another sign from you, Jesus. Oh, that was something miraculous. Well, it was from Satan. It was satanic power. And, and over and over again in scripture and in the gospels, we see the religious leaders opposing Jesus. And Jesus, at the end of his life, was rejected by most Israelites. Though he was welcomed as a man riding a donkey, and people gathered really to worship him as he entered into the holy city, Jerusalem, for the final time. At the end of the week, they called for him to be crucified. John 1.11 says that he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. And in the end, Jesus' own people crucify, decided to crucify the Son of God instead of a rebel leader. Jesus was pierced through for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, suffering anguish and torment on the cross. And to top it off, on the cross, Jesus himself is abandoned by God. As he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that is God's plan for how Jesus would become the ruler of the world. This was the path of suffering before glory. The path path of humility before exaltation. It was humiliation before honor. So by contrast, Satan's plan appears far easier, doesn't it? It seems simple. It's uh, comfortable. It's the path of least resistance. Satan's temptation was for Jesus to take the easier path, to avoid the persecution, to avoid the betrayal, to avoid rejection, to avoid crucifixion, to avoid abandonment by almost all of his earthly friends and even God the Father for moments on the cross. And Jesus responds to Satan's temptation by quoting the Shema, a set of verses that he had learned since he was a child, which says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Jesus rejected Satan's offer and he chose the stripes. He chose the rejection. He chose the nails and he embraced God's plan of rejection, abandonment, and humiliation. He chose the cross. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. And for us today, we often question God's plans. We would prefer to write our story in our way, as we like it, with a bow on top, happily ever after. We desire to live our lives on our own terms instead of on God's terms. But I would ask you this morning, 
How will you live your life? Will you live according to God's plans or according to your plans? Will you embrace God's ways or demand your way? Are God's ways truly higher and better than our ways? Are you willing to trust God even though you may not agree with his plans? Even though his plans involve much more difficulty? Maybe you're not happy about your circumstances. Maybe you're unhappy with your job, your coworkers, your work situation, or lack thereof. Maybe you're not happy with your relationships, with your friends, with your family, inside your home. And maybe you would just like to take matters into your own hands and to do things in a shortcut way, to take the easier path instead of doing what God's word says to do. That's the temptation to reject God's plan. That's the temptation to do your own thing, to find your own workaround. But his ways are higher than your ways. And his plans are better than your plans because he does truly know what is best for you. Today, we've looked at the temptation of Jesus Christ. And after God the Father identified the Messiah, Satan decides to go and personally tempt Jesus. Satan might have been sly, but Jesus' answers showed that he knew God's word and he lived in accordance with it. That Jesus had hidden God's word in his, high, in his heart that he might not sin against God. And for us as Christians today, it's a reminder that we need to know the word of God if we want to draw near to the God of the word. That we need to skillfully defend ourselves against the devil's lies. That we need to know and live according to God's word. Instead of doubting God's care, we need to trust him to take care of us. Instead of testing God's protection, we need to take God at his word. And instead of rejecting God's plan for our lives, when things are more difficult, we need to embrace and follow his ways. This is what Jesus models for us when he stood against Satan in the wilderness. Jesus modeled true and abiding faith in God, a faith that was immovable, a faith that res was resolute, a faith that was deeply grounded, that he trusted the Lord in everything, and while you and I may falter and fall into Satan's schemes, Jesus did not. He did not succumb to Satan's temptations. He rejected and refuted the devil's lies. Jesus succeeded where Adam failed. Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience unto the Lord. Jesus successfully rejected all temptations and obeyed God in everything that he did. Yet Jesus suffered and died on the cross. He did not deserve it. He willingly agreed to be the sacrifice for sin so that those who had sinned might be reconciled to God. This is the glory of Christmas, that God sent his son into the world, that we might have eternal life. Jesus was willing to be treated as a sinner on the cross, so that sinners like you and me could be saved if we would put our trust in him, if we would confess that Jesus is the only reason we can be saved. And so the only application I have for this morning is the lingering question, do you trust in Jesus Christ? Do you trust in him? He is far greater and far better. He is the true and better Adam. And he is the one that God sent to save us, to rescue us, and to redeem us. And he offers salvation for those who would believe. Let me pray for us. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for the wonder of Christmas for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life of obedience, 
and yet suffered and died on the cross so that we might be reconciled to you. What wonderful love, what boundless grace, what unfathomable mercy. We thank you that at Christmas we can remember that the baby born in a manger would be the one sacrificed on the cross who is the one who is exalted high even now. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.